after a while, after a while, stepped in the furnace, step in the furnace, long time ago, long time ago, shattered and be shattered, can be shattered. Jesus will yeah. fix it yeah. because he's sovereign, yeah. he's omnipotent, yeah. Yeah. he's omniscient, yeah. he's all-knowing, all-powerful. And there's no problem too big that with his help, he cannot solve. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good morning, Loveland. Good morning. Good morning. The psalmist says that I will bless the Lord at all times. Uh -huh. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Hallelujah. 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 So we're going to open the service this morning with a call to worship by reciting the 100 psalm. Please repeat after me. And the psalmist says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us. It is he that has made us. And not we ourselves. And not we ourselves. We are his people. We are his people. And the sheep of his pasture. And the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. And into his courts with praise. And into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. 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 And bless his name. And bless his name. For the Lord is yes. good. For the Lord is good. 
His mercy is everlasting. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures. And his truth endures. To all generations. To all generations. Hallelujah. Let's worship and praise him this morning. Hallelujah. For he indeed is worthy. Hallelujah. Amen. Mighty God. Let's bow. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Father, we say thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again, Father, that this is the day that you have made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. Yes, sir. And we come before you this morning, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Thanking you, Father, for your amazing grace, Father, that's woke us up this morning. We thank you, Lord God, for loving us so much that you gave us heaven's best, Father God. The Lord Jesus Christ, that because we put our faith and trust in him, we should not perish but have everlasting life. We say thank you, Lord. Now, right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up this morning's service, Father. We pray, Lord God, for the man of God or woman of God who will preach the word, Father. We pray in the name of Jesus that your word will go forth with the unction of the Holy Spirit. We pray in the name of Jesus, Heavenly Father, for the salvation of the lost. We pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God, for the healing of the sick. We pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God, for the, for the strengthening of those who are weak. We pray, Lord God, in the name of Jesus that you would deliver those who are bound. We pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that you would heal relationships and families, Lord God. We pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God, for breakthroughs in the lives of your people, Father God, knowing that you are the Lord of the breakthrough, Father God. You are the almighty, omnipotent one, Lord God. You are El Shaddai, Heavenly Father. We bless your name. So, Father, right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we cast our cares, our worries, our anxieties, our fears on you, Lord God, knowing, Lord God, that you are well able to take care of them, Father God. For your word plainly tells us, Father God, to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. We are to let our requests be made known unto God. And when we do that, Father, you say that the peace of God that passes all understanding shall guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, Father God. So we thank you, Father God, for the peace of God, and we thank you for peace with God, and we thank you for the peace in God, Heavenly Father. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we thank you and praise you that we have victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, Father God, because we are more than conquerors through him that loved us, Father God. And, Father, we thank you, God, that it's God before us who can be against us, Father God. So, Father God, we want to worship you this morning in spirit and in truth, Father God. And we know, Lord God, that when praises go up, blessings come down, Father God. So we praise you and thank you, Father God, in advance for what you're going to do. We pray this morning that everything will be done decently and in order, Father God. And we know that Jesus will be lifted up. And as he's lifted up, Father God, we pray that all men will be drawn unto you. So we give you the praise, we give you the honor, and we give you all the glory. And it's in Jesus' name. And everyone in agreement says, amen, amen, and amen.
well in that great egg in the morning. Very well, very well in that great in the morning. Very well. Precious in the sight of God. No man Amen. can hinder me. No hinder. All right, all right. Good morning, good morning. Let's give the choir a round of applause. A big hand for the wonderful singing that they do. We, we thank you. We thank you. Well, good morning, Loveland. Good morning. Let us take a moment to greet some very special people. If you're here for the very first time experiencing the Loveland's worship service, would you please stand? Don't be ashamed. Please stand. All right. Amen. Welcome. Amen. On behalf of our senior pastor, Chuck Singleton, and his wife, First Lady, please stand. On behalf of our senior pastor, Chuck Singleton, and his wife, First Lady, Charlene Singleton, and the entire Loveland family, 
We welcome you this morning to our worship service. Oh Lord, we thank you. Thank you for coming this morning. Because Jesus is Lord, the mission of Loveland Church is to worship, evangelize, disciple, serve, and fellowship, maximize the lives of triumphant living in order to reach the world. Why? Because love wins a place for you, you, and you. Now, will the entire Loveland family please stand? Greet our visitors and each other with a Loveland worship. Greeting. Amen, amen, and amen. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Good morning, Loveland. Good morning. 2013. God so is good. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. Lord, you know it's you that I trust. All right. Yes, yes, Thank yes. You, Thank you. Hey, we getting ready right now to Hallelujah. go ahead and usher in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I have a testimony to give about how good God is if you wait on him. When I first came to Loveland Church, I used to want to be playing the drums and yes. sitting in the band and things. But God said, that's not what I want for you. Come on. After going through a little training and a little praying and a little bit of patience and faith, God took me to another level this week. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. I was elevated from the drummer who I wanted to be to the president of the choir so I thank God for that today some people think their award you know when you see the award shows and you see those golden trophies that they give well the Lord that I serve he says when you do the work that I give you Amen. come on come on come yes. on Amen. and you make it to those pearly gates I got wings for you so I'm working on my wings right now. <laughs> All right. Hey, amen. And I will trust in you. Yes. 
with all of my heart. Hey, with all my heart. Yes, I will. And I won't leave. Yes, yes, yes. To my own understanding. Jesus. Yeah. And all of my ways, I'll acknowledge you. Yes, yes, yes. you know that problem that you came in here with today it's too big for you you need to turn it over to the Lord you need to find yourself a secret place and I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do help you build an altar get down on your knees. Yes. Throw your head back, put your hand up, and call the name of Jesus. 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 Jesus.
sir. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning Good to, to you. See You know what to do. Morning, Pastor. Morning, Pastor. Bless you. Morning, Pastor. My Lord. That's good. I received that. Bless you, Pastor. See you. Lord, we sang that song. <laughs> Find another song. <laughs> Let's give the Lord another hand clap of praise for our male chorus. Amen. Wow. What a blessing. What a blessing. What a blessing. Thank you, band. Give the Lord a big joyful shout. Will Macmillan on the drums and Brother Cleaver on the bass and Brother Gordon. I found out Reverend Gordon, he's a preacher. Uh-huh, see, he was trying to slip by, and I didn't, but stuff comes out. Bless you. Brothers, now they're in. Let's, let's give a hand clap for the male chorus. Amen. Amen. Let's open our Bibles now. Let's go to the Word of God. To the word of God, 1 Thessalonians this morning. 1 Thessalonians. Now I'm sharing with you this morning what I shared with the second Ontario service last Sunday. You had another speaker last Sunday morning. She is in London this morning, freezing. She said, it's cold over here. I said, oh, really? You should be in sunny Southern California. <laughs> when I was driving up, my, my car, the temperature thing said it was 33 outdoors. That's one degree above freezing. Everybody know that? Being from Illinois, we kind of, you know, watch that when it's, when it's that cold, it's cold. <laughs> they used to call it the hawk. First Thessalonians chapter number five, and uh, just, just to, uh, in fact, I'll throw one verse on just for good measure. From verse number 23, and uh, for good measure, we'll also throw in 24. I don't know that we'll cover it. But in the context of our reading, it is just uh, prudent. It just makes good sense. Now, the book says, may the God of peace himself. May the God of peace himself. Not talking about, listen, in case you came from a background where angels came to help you or, or somebody else. Listen to what the book says, himself. The, the book of Hebrews, which we're studying on Wednesday night, you ought to come out and join us. Amen, amen, amen. Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, tells us clearly that there's no mediator between God and man. You don't need, I, excuse, I bless her, bless the Virgin Mary. Praise God for her. But she would not like you talking to her to get to her God. So may the God himself, may the God of peace himself, sanctify you completely. Wow. Everything about you. May he sanctify you completely and may your whole, that, that whole means what? I knew you knew that. I mean, look at the intelligence of members of this church. May your whole, listen now, spirit, soul, and body, the all three parts of you, turn to somebody and tell them there's three of you standing there. Just tell somebody that. There. Be preserved blameless 
at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we'll throw in verse 24, just for the sake of uh, getting blessed, he who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Father, bless your word in our time together in it this morning. Be glorified, not only this morning, but as we enter into, as we have entered into a new year, may it be for many a new life. May it be for most uh, a change, uh, up. May, may it be for each of us a, a, a gripping and grabbing of the whole person to be all that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Praise God. This is a brand new year. Amen. A brand new year, which for most of us represents a brand new opportunity to do great things. Now, what it's going to take is change. Amen. So there's got to be some changes. You can't expect different results if you keep doing the same whole thing. I heard about a fellow who was uh, really wanting to make some changes in his life, and one of the things he wanted to do was find him a good woman. So he found a beautiful girl and uh, uh, began to date her. And as he did, he visited her house and uh, he saw, uh, among other things, a picture of a fella on her mantle. And so he asked her, who is this guy? And uh, she said, oh, don't, you know, don't worry about it. I'll tell you another time. Well, they got real close, real fast. And, uh, but every time he'd come by, he said, can you tell me, who is this guy? And she said, you know, just, yeah, chillax. We, you know, I, I tell you, we'll get around to that sooner or later. And uh, they got so close that he, he finally asked her to be his wife. This is one of the changes that he wanted in his life. And uh, lo and behold, she said yes, and they got married, and uh, it was their honeymoon. They were about to go on their honeymoon. <laughs> when uh, he thought he'd ask one more time, tell me, who is that, who is that fella on that picture? And uh, she said, well, that was me before my surgery. <laughs> He said he wanted change, right? So here was a good opportunity for someone who made a change. Not necessarily for the better. Uh, but, but let me ask this. How many folks here, and you don't have to raise your hand on this question, how many folks here uh, realize that uh, you could do some things better if you make certain changes. How many people realize that? Yeah. Uh, and uh, so let, let's, let's lay the, the framework for that change. I mean, rather than kind of uh, rather than kind of cherry picking what we're going to change, let, let's just take a look at uh, who we are. You can't really change you until you know you. And, and, and it's important to know for me and for you who you are as a whole in order to change any part. In order to change any part of you, you got to know. Because see, what happens is we try to change this without realizing that the reason for this is that, way over there. And, and there's, a, there's a relationship. So, so look at this verse again in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. It is, w watch this word. Now, I'm not going to give a whole bunch of Greek uh, this morning, and for the benefit of those who may be visiting with us or guests, uh, the, 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 the Greek language, Koine Greek, the old Greek, is the language in which the New Testament, the Bible, New Testament was written. And uh, this verse is written in what we call the Aris passive tense. Aris, A-O-R-I-S-T, passive tense which means that as is the case with English, pretty much every other language, in the sentence there is a subject 
and there's an object. There's a subject and there's an object. But I said this, it was aorist and passive. So take a look at it and let's see what that just might mean. Uh, there, there, there's action in it. That, that's what Eris implies. Some action has taken place. Some action has taken place. But the action taking place is carried out by the subject of the sentence. So now can you figure out who the subject of the sentence is? God. That's right. So the, the action carried out is carried out by the subject of the sentence. Now, just so you, it's not real deep. It, it, somebody might say this is Greek to me. Well, it is, but, but watch this. It's not real deep. I, I want to just kind of demonstrate it. Pastor Rob, can I get you to take your arms from around that lovely lady for just a minute? <laughs> Sir, may I ask you to come over here from that lovely lady who knows how to put some cabbage and greens together that <laughs> cures all diseases. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then I need one other volunteer. Who, who can I get to volunteer? All right, come on, come on, Greg. Uh, all right, so now we're going to put you in a very strange position in the heiress passive tense. I trust you. You're going to be God. All right, and uh, Greg, over here, there's a subject in the sentence. Can you figure out what the subject is? Take a look at it again. Look at your Bible. What's the subject? All right, now well, look for the verb. The verb is sanctify, right. So now what comes after the verb? You, there it is, you. So here's what we got. We got God doing something to you. So sir, yes. you are the object, the object of the sentence. So what we have is a, is a subject and an object and a Verb in between the two. Now, when, when you put all the other stuff in there, you know, you get conjunctions and, and all those other phrases in English, Greek, any language, all those other things. But the most important thing about any sentence uh, are the object, subject, and the verb. When you put all those together, you got, so here's what's going to happen. Uh, Chuck is going to run home. So what happened? Chuck ran home. It's real simple. The, those three things are the most important part. Because it's in the aorist passive, Here's what takes place. In the Aris passive, we don't have all that in the English, but in Greek, we do. Don't have that in Hebrew, in the Old Testament, but in the Greek, we do. So what happens is God is going to do something to the object. What's he going to do? Sanctify. Sanctify. But we said it was not only Aris, it is passive, which implies clearly that there is somebody passive in this construction. What's passive mean? He ain't doing nothing. He ain't doing nothing. But now, you might think the passive one is you, but here's the idea behind it, really. God is the one who's being passive. Why would God be passive? He will be passive until he knows that you want to be All right, now who didn't get it? No, if, you, if you're willing to admit it. Who didn't get it? Real simple. Here's what it means. That God wants to take an action on you but will not do it until he knows until he knows that you want to get it done. Thank you, brother. Now, now watch. With that being the framework, the foundation for everything that we're going to do now in these next few minutes, with that being the framework, what just happened? Here's what we found out. There's something that God himself wants that will not happen unless you Cooperate. So how do I cooperate? Let's take a look at the verse again. Now, here's what Paul says. May the God of peace himself sanctify you. Look at that big word, holy. W-H, not H-O-L-Y, 
W-H-O-L-Y. You know you see it oftentimes. You go to a health food store or maybe you go to some department of the grocery store and they talk about whole foods or holistic lifestyle. So what are they talking about? They're talking about it's, it's a little more than uh, normal. It's not partial. It's everything about it. Uh, so the, the idea is this. Now watch, because when, you, when we see the word sanctify, we start thinking about denominations. You know, it was the Baptist, Methodist, and the sanctified folks <laughs> in the old church. For those who just got saved last year, the, the, the old church used to have that, and the, and the sanctified. But they were called sanctified because they claimed that name as if they were the only ones who were. Now, you and I know that that's not the case. In fact, in many cases, it, uh, it took away from the beauty of what it means to be sanctified. Because we thought it was all about lipstick and makeup and how long your skirt was and, uh, and not letting anybody know that you fornicated. All right. I beg your pardon. I mean, because, you know, they didn't talk about it. So it was easy to just kind of pretend like nothing was going on. And we later found out the sanctified kids was doing worse than we were. And... Okay, all right, y'all. Here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line. That here's what he just told us in this text. That he wants us to be holy, completely sanctified, but listen to where he put it. He said in that verse, look at it, may your whole watch again, spirit, soul, and body. Wow. So the whole you, sanctified. Not, not your spirit, but the whole you. The whole you holy, that's not what he said. It wasn't H-O-L-Y, was it? It was W-H-O-L-L-Y. So he's talking about something that's complete. So he wants to complete you. He wants to complete you in your spirit, your soul, and your body. Sanctify, take that word, hagiazo, H-A-G-I-A-Z-O, and uh, listen to it. Now watch, scoot up close, especially young people who think that's not for you. Come here. Now don't get up, but just come here. Watch, watch this. Here's the idea behind it. Here's the idea, that to be sanctified. See, there are some things you have that are sanctified. And you may not even know they were. Uh, my Bible. Yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe, maybe. But I can guarantee you there's something to you that's more sanctified to you than your Bible. Your toothbrush. Yeah, you let somebody else use your Bible. <laughs> can I get a witness somewhere? But you don't want not. Mama, let mama want to, I can't find no Bible, honey, you got, yeah, here, you, mama, you can use my Bible. I, I can't find my toothbrush. Uh, <laughs> let me help you find it, mama. <laughs> let, me, let me help you find it, right? You don't want nobody using your toothbrush. Now, what that means, so, so what does sanctified really mean? It's not talking about how heavenly it is. That's really not the point. Sanctified means how set aside it is. How set aside it is. So what what sanctified means is what? Set aside. And in, in the particular case when we're dealing with Scripture, we're, of course, talking about things that are set aside for God. And uh, so here's what he said. And let's start with your soul. Here, here's what he said. He said spirit, soul, and body. But we'll start with soul because for most of us, the battle is in the mind. It's in the mind. So when he talks about being set aside, he's saying not ordinary, not ordinary, not ordinary. If it's not ordinary, then it must be, who said that? Who said that? Yeah, you see, good, good. Extraordinary. It must be extraordinary. So what, what does God want from my soul? I am to be extraordinary. 
I'm, I'm, I, you, you can't just walk in on me and tell me how to think. Because you, you mess me up. I, I don't want to think like you think I should think. You can't just walk on me. You can't walk up to me and say, look, Chuck, here's how I want you to think from now on. From now on, I want you to think like this. Be down on yourself. From now on, I, I want you to hate your wife. From now on, I want you to not like the way you look, the way you pray. I want you to hate Chuck. And while you edit, anybody comes around you, you may as well work on them too. You know? <laughs> Just be a hater. And I say, yeah, okay, I got that. I got it. Now, I can do that. Let me write that down. And so now I start off. I, I go through life because you think I ought to think like that. So what, what's got to happen is this. I've got to not only say you can't come in and tell me how to think. I need to go back. This is 2013. I need to go back to 12 and 11, and 10, and maybe 1995, and figure out who has affected my thinking. When you look at Genesis chapter 3, you find God Almighty asking Adam and Eve three questions. Three. This is right as they sinned. And God came to them and asked them three questions. And those questions are questions that every believer ought to ask themselves or allow God, the one who wants to sanctify you, let him ask those questions. In Genesis 3, here's the first one. Here's the first one. I'll, I'll quote it from King James because it sounds so good. Where art thou? Let me take that down to the street. Where you at? I mean, because literally, uh, how, how can you figure out where you're going if you don't know where you're at? So in order to deal with my thinking and to get it straight, I've got to deal with where I am. I've got to, I've got to come to a place of, of, of figuring that out. And see, you see, because what, what I, where I am is a... Is a uh, putting together, it is a conglomeration of all the thoughts that have brought me to this place. And there are sitting among us some who are down on themselves. The worst hater of you is often you. The thoughts that are in your head often have come from you. Some were picked up because people kept saying it to you. And so you figured they were right. They call you names that you'd never heard before. But they call you those names so many times that you decided it had to be true. And there's a place where God comes and he wants to know where are you. You got to understand this thing about God. When Genesis 3, when he came to Adam and Eve and asked that question, where art thou? They had just sinned. They had just sinned. Somebody say it with me. They had just sinned. It would seem that God would not be coming to them asking a question that he already knew the answer to. Yeah. Yeah. They sinned. It seems that God would go back to his place in heaven, sit on the throne, and separate himself eternally from them. But instead, he comes to them. So rather than looking at it as God the judge coming to them, understand it as God the lover coming to them. He came to them to ask the question, where are you, even though he didn't have to? Rather than running from the question, run to it. Run to the one who's asking the question, where art thou? Look at the second question. The second one he asked is this. When they said we were naked and we heard you coming, so we covered ourselves. And God's second question was, who told you? You were naked. I'm aiming at two of y'all there, a man and his wife. What's, what's naked? What y'all? Why y'all trying to hide? What's the deal? Who told you you were naked? Where'd you get that from? Who put that in your head? Who told you you were naked? There are folks that, that go through their lives living based on what somebody else told you. Who told you you were dumb? 
Who told you you were stupid? Who told you you, were, you couldn't do it? Who told you you were too black, too white, too, 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 too poor, too female? Too, who, who told you you weren't tall enough? Who told you you weren't good enough? Who told you you weren't good looking? Who told you you couldn't climb that mountain? Who told you you couldn't pass that test? Who told you you weren't an A student? Who told you you couldn't achieve? Who told you you couldn't climb to the heights? Who told you that? Who told you that? Who told you that? Who told you that? Because for most people, they spend their days living on what? Somebody else told you. So here, here, here's something you ought to do coming into the new year. Here's something you ought to make a part of your plan to make 13 better than 12, better than 11, better than 9. Here's one thing you ought to do. Figure out who told you that. If there's, if there's anything that ought to be, and I think is, insulting to God is when his people that he created are shaping their destinies based on what somebody else. <laughs> let, me give you, let me give you the final question. We saw, where are you? That's in verse 9 of Genesis 3. Uh, we saw this question is, is who told you, verse 11. But then in verse 13 of Genesis 3, he, here's a question that, that everybody has to deal with, and it's the one we don't want to hear. And, and it's interesting because that's the last of the three questions, and it would seem to us it would be the first. Because the reason why they were there, what's the reason why they were there? Why were they hiding? They had sin. They were covering themselves because they had sin. But only after asking the first two questions did God ask, what did you do? Now, he knew. But he didn't even deal with their sin in their spirit until he dealt with their heads. Yeah, some people can't repent right because they don't think right. You, you can't get it straight with God and it's not straight in here. You, you, can, you, can, you can get cleansed but you go right back same thing. The problem is stinking thinking. You go right back to the same thing. So he asked after dealing with the first two parts then he asked the question what is this you have done? Because uh, the bottom line uh, is, is this that uh, sin is the easiest thing to handle. It's already been paid for. <laughs> no problem with that. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins, cleanse us. That's the easiest thing. Now, don't ever take it for granted. Don't make a disgrace out of his grace. You don't, don't ever take that for granted. Oh, I can do whatever I want. God, God forgive me. Let me, go. Let me do the same thing again. No, that's not. You know, whom the Lord loves, the Lord chastens, so he, he'll get you. He will get you. He will get you. Uh, but but the, the point is this, that the cross covered your sin. Now, I'm heading towards the second part of this message. But watch, watch what happens. That if you understand salvation, get it. And if you have heard this before, listen closer. Your sin has been covered by the cross. You know what Jesus did when you came to him? Listen close. He forgave all of your sins. See, you heard that 95 million times. So you, so you thought I was going to say something deep when I... But it's deeper probably than you have thought. He forgave all of your sins. Period, comma, past, 
present and future, period. What'd you just say? What, what I just said is this, that your sins, when you came to Christ, he forgave that which you'd already done. We accept that and we believe that. But he also forgave that which you might have been doing at that moment. And then he looked forward into 2012 and 2013, 14 and 15, and forgave those. What, well, Pastor Chuck, you trying to tell me just, no, here's what I'm saying. doesn't mean you do whatever you want. It means you understand that his forgiveness also established a relationship with you, which means that now you will get a spanking when you sin, all right? He, whom the Lord loves, he will chasten. But, but I don't have time to deal with that totally, but I want you to see it this way. Salvation, therefore, is in three tenses. Past tense, present, future. This is my sin. I have been forgiven, covered in the blood. He has washed me clean of my sin. Salvation is past, present, future. Salvation is justification. Underneath the blood, he's changing me by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm not what I ought to be. But oh, I thank God that I'm not what I used to be. And I bless God that I shall be what I'm going to be. He has forgiven me. Past, present, future, justification, sanctification glorification saved me from the penalty of sin saving me saving me from the power of sin and one day when he shall return will save me from the presence of sin I have been saved I am being saved I shall be saved. He has washed me in his blood. Anything short of that is religion. Anything short of that is my effort and my own credit. I take no credit because Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain but he washed it white as snow. Somebody ought to find a hallelujah and a holy hand wave for the Lord. Now, you saw those three tenses of salvation. Watch what happened. See, because when Adam, when Adam sinned, when, when he committed this first sin, now may the God himself, may God, the God of peace himself sanctify you. Listen, when Adam sinned, he had been warned, he had been warned that the day you sin. What? You shall surely die. I like that surely in there too because what he said, not the next day, not next week, not next year, but on that day, on the day that you sin, you will surely die. But here's a question. When Adam sinned, did he fall over dead? No. <laughs> but he died, didn't he? Turn to somebody and tell him how he died. He died spiritually. He died spiritually. So watch. He died in the spirit, which was the worst kind of way to die. Somebody said, well, I'm glad he wouldn't, didn't have a heart attack. Man. No, I mean, that was the worst kind of death. He died in the worst way. He died spiritually. He died in his spirit immediately. But then when you follow, when you follow the narrative in the book of Genesis in the first three, four chapters, 
You get around chapter 5, and you begin to see men doing strange things. And you get chapter 5 and 6, and you see the Bible saying this, that uh, God was repented, some versions say, that he ever made man because the wickedness of man had grown. And everything in his imagination that he found to do, he found his way to do it. And so what was happening is this. While God made, for example, Adam and gave him a wife named Eve, by the time you get around chapter 5 and 6, 7 in there, guys start taking more than one wife. You know, I need another one. Yeah. I need a couple of these. I mean, you know, you, you, people kind of think, well, you know, he just wanted more and more women so he could have more and more women. <laughs> but, but I, you know, I, I kind of think it wasn't so much that, not only for Adam, but not Adam. Adam didn't do it, but for those that came along later, uh, and then David and Solomon and all that, it was just when this one ain't acting right, I can go to that one. I think that was... Y'all don't like my theory. Okay. <laughs> and so it was, you know, the idea was, you know, I, you know, I, Solomon, he had all them wives and concubines, you know. You know, I, I ain't got to stay here now. You don't act right to find out. <laughs> oh, you either? Okay, fine. I catch you next year. I mean, you know, fine. He had 300 concubines. He can just pick and choose. You having a good day today? All right. <laughs> you know, you're my wife today. <laughs> but... Men, men started to imagine how to, how to do things, and, and they kind of began to pervert. So Adam died immediately in his spirit. Gradually, men died in their souls. And eventually, in their bodies. And in the same narrative, Jesus in John chapter 3 you must be what? Born again. Men, men are born again immediately in their spirit, right there on the spot, right there on the right. You know, you know that moment you were saved. You know it. I know it. I remember mine. I, I, what a blessing it was. I knew that I was born again. My spirit connected with God's spirit. John put it this way in 1 John. And we know that God's spirit witnesses with our spirit that we are the sons of God. We know that we belong to God. Is it based on me understanding it? Is it based on me knowing more verses than somebody else? No, man, I didn't know a whole bunch of verses. It came from a witness on the inside. The Holy Spirit touched my spirit and I knew I was saved. That's the reason why a little child can walk down an aisle right there on the moment and that little kid can know that no good and well I'm saved right there on the spot. And an old man cannot be sure because it hadn't happened yet. Why can a little child know and an old man not know? Well, it's because it's the witness of the spirit in the spirit. You're born again immediately in your spirit. Gradually in the mind. Be not conformed to this world. But what? Be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. So that the mind over time, eventually, the mind is transformed. And then the book tells us again in 1 John, it's not yet known what we shall be. <laughs> oh God, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. So we're born again immediately in our spirits, gradually in our minds, and eventually in our bodies. Now, now watch and we'll close. Watch this. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify. We gave you the word hagiazo. Extraordinary. That you be extraordinary. In your mind, that you would think different than other people think. That the things that knock other people down would stand you up. Things that make other people get a question mark would give you an exclamation mark. Things that make other people quiver and shake 
would make you firm and faithful. Things that would tear other men down would make you brothers stand up strong. Things that would depress would make you delight. Things that make folks doubt would make you shout. Why? Because you're looking into the face of God the whole time and you know many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. Watch him because he says that not only with your mind, he says your whole spirit, the pneuma. Now, I'm going to quickly break it down. Listen, I told you two Sundays ago, there were three great prophets in the Old Testament, all of whom got down. You need not go where they went, even though they were prophets. Moses didn't have what you got. You ain't listening. I said Moses didn't have what you got. David didn't have what you have. Elijah didn't have what you have. Jonah didn't have what you have. They had visitations of the Holy Spirit. But you're on this side of the cross. You're on this side of Pentecost. David had to pray a prayer like this, and you dare not pray it. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You don't have to pray that prayer because God won't. He might take you from the earth, but he ain't taking the Holy Ghost from you. You, you, you may not be always filled with the Holy Spirit, but you don't ever lose the Holy Spirit. In fact, Romans chapter 8, verse 9, for the benefit of those who might not know that, the Bible says if you have not the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to him. That's New Testament. These three great prophets, who were they? Here they are. Moses. They all said the same thing. Moses, Elijah, Jonah. They all got so depressed got so down they all three said the same thing you know what they said all three of them said God if you care anything about me kill me I want to die <laughs> imagine Moses thou shalt not the thou shalt. ten commandments God thundering off Mount Sinai him coming down with the tablets God speaking to him visiting him Moses the one that stood up over the Red Sea touched the staff to the water and the water parted Moses the one that led the children of Israel right into the promise. Moses, the one who God used and chose, revered even to this day in Israel, got so depressed, he said, I want to die. <laughs> Elijah, Elijah, great prophet. Man, he was so powerful. I mean, seven major miracles listed in 1 Kings. I won't go through all of them right now. I don't have the time. But I want you to know one. Here's one great miracle. He was uh, on Mount Carmel. I've stood on Mount Carmel. I've stood there where he thundered and preached with power. Prophets, false prophets of Baal. And uh, he, he said, look, I'll tell you what. You get the first opportunity. Why don't we see who's right by calling down fire from heaven? And the one that God sends the fire for, we know he's on their side. You get the first chance. Go and do it. <laughs> and, and the Bible records that they called down, they called, they said, send fire they, uh, all day, morning, all noon. They kept fire, send fire. They cut themselves. They did all kinds of things and no fire fell. Elijah said, all right, get out the way. My turn. <laughs> And he stood up and began to pronounce and preach and prophesy. And the word says fire came from heaven. Burn up the wood that they prepared. Burn up the meat offerings that had been prepared. He even told them, pour some water on it. I'll show you what kind of fire this is. And they ain't even scared of water. And it burned up the water. Burn up the sand and the rocks in the riverbed. God answered him on Mount Carmel. Well, a little while later, woman got after him. <laughs> Never underestimate. <laughs> Her name was Jezebel. Now, people call women Jezebels when they're, you know, acting up, overdoing the makeup and all that they used to call them and that's because the Bible records 
Jezebel preparing her makeup. She was going to get him. I can't be going to get nobody without my lipstick on. I'm on. I'm on. <laughs> so she, she was coming after him. He heard she was coming. Elijah took off running. He took off running. And, uh, you know, argued the, the distance he might have run, but it's estimated it's probably about 40 miles. That's long in the marathon. I did 26.2 in the marathon. He, he ran 40 miles, hadn't had nothing to eat. He was just, I mean, they didn't have any, any juice stands on the way, no monster, rock star, no energy drinks. He didn't get a chance to do any of that. He ran 40 miles, and he got 40 miles away. And then he, whoo, whoo. God, if you care anything about me, I want to die. Kill me. Kill me. Kill me. And then Jonah was the third one. And Jonah, you remember him? He was the one that, yeah. He, he was to go prophesy by God's instruction. Preacher had an assignment. I want you to go preach here. And uh, Jonah didn't want to do it. He didn't preach then. I know what happens when I preach. Your word, you, you, your word changes lives. You, you change people. And I don't like them. I don't want them changed. Let them go to hell. I don't want to talk to them. I don't talk to them. And, and God said, no, I want you to go. And so he decided to not go. So uh, God told him to go east. He headed west and got shipwrecked, swallowed by a whale. And then the whale sped him up regurgitated him right on the shores of the place where God told him to go. Oh, you going that? I told you to go this way. You going, okay, I, I got something for you. I, I handle you. That, that big fish swallowed him, and then he gets regurgitated right on the shore. Okay, God, I guess you want me to preach. I, all right, I'll preach. So he comes walking up on the beach. You can imagine what that must have been like. Mothers on the beach with their daughters and children. And uh, Jonah comes walking out of the water with seaweed over one ear, fish hopping out of his pocket and uh, stinking and uh, saying, repent, repent. And the Bible says everything in town repented. The, the men repented, the women, the children. The, the donkeys, they put sackcloth and ashes on all the animals, everything in town, repent it. <laughs> and then Jonah went out to the side of the road and he said, Lord, if you care anything about me, kill me. Them Ninevites have repented. Kill me. I want to die. You, I did what you told me. Now kill me. Now watch with, with Moses, with Elijah, with Jonah. With, with, the, with Elijah, God gave him a real simple answer. Eat. <laughs> boy, you just ran 40 miles. Boy, get something to eat. You need something to eat. So he sent him a bird with some food and some water. and said, Eat and drink something, you know. Because, see, your problem may not start in your spirit. And, in fact, your problem may not even start in your mind. Your problem may start in your body. It might be how you're taking care of yourself in 2012 and 13. It may be what you eat. It, it does affect you. People don't think so, but it does. It, what you eat or what you don't eat, it does affect you. Uh, that it does have an impact on you on mood, on, on, on attitude. It does affect you. Churches are known for fried chicken, just slopping fried chicken all over the We are known for just eating all the fried. We've been trying to get even with them chickens ever since that bird told on Peter. Just fried chicken. Thank God for cabbage and green. Uh, <laughs> But, got a clothes. But we, you know, and God just, just had Elijah eat. Just eat. Well, you need something to eat. So he ate. He felt better. 
Listen, I said he felt better. Well, what did he do? He ate and he what? Felt better. So that his mood, his attitude, even his very life was affected by what he ate. Moses, Moses, Lord, kill me. Why? Because he had the pressure of all the people. He was not only the leader that brought them into the, out of the Egypt, into the wilderness, headed to the promised land. Not only was he their leader, but he was also the judge. I mean, listen, think about judge. We look at Bible and we see judge and we think it's something, but it, it is the municipal judge. It's the traffic judge. It's the dispute judge. It's the lawsuit judge. He's judging everything. There's two million people. Moses is handling all of it. Every time there was a dispute, I'm going to talk to Moses. Yeah, come on. And every one of them was coming. So what did God do? God sent his father-in-law, Jethro. And Jethro said, boy, what are you, listen to what he said to him. He said, what are you doing to yourself? And what are you doing to this people? You think you're helping, but you're really not. Man, you're all stressed out trying to leave. You, you cannot leave them all stressed out. Listen, break it down. Get some lieutenants and get some generals and then get some sergeants. Break this thing down and let other people handle some of this stuff. You're trying to handle too much. You're all stressed out. It's not food that you need. It's not even an anointing that you need. What you need is to get organized. You're just too disorganized, boy. Get yourself organized. So there are some folks that are all stressed out. Their lives are not together for one reason. They are just dis. Organize. The mind can't function correctly. So Moses organized it. Jonah, God let him sit down in that gourd for a while and cry. And then God spoke. He needed the word. He needed the word. And God said, are yeah, you mad because I use my word? that you preach <laughs> and change some lives. He said, what if I'd kill this Gordon? That wouldn't have bothered you, huh? You wanted me to kill some people. And Jonah repented because his problem was spiritual. Some people, the problem starts in the spirit and they need to get right with God. For some people, the problem starts in the mind they need to get right with their world around them, their world. And for some people, it starts with the physical man, and they need to get right with nutrition and, and rest. <laughs> and maybe walking, some other form of exercise. If Jonah had run like Elijah, if Moses was as organized as Jonah, and if Jonah was as strong in the spirit as Moses, neither one of them would have ever said, Lord, kill me. <laughs> now may the God of peace himself say, I don't have time to deal with this wholly, but we'll get to that completely because there's some synergy there, synergy. They work together. The spirit affects the mind, affects the body. And I'm in order when I let God's spirit speak to my spirit, which then speaks to my mind and controls my body. The whole reason for fasting is that I'm saying to my body, you ain't in charge. You do what I say. May not be any more than a fast from sweets or meats. Or may not be any more than a Daniel fast or a fast to the end of a day. But I'm saying to my body, I got this. I'm in control. Father, bless your word. And cause it to take root in the hearts and minds of every child of God who hears right now or who hears later by CD or DVD, we pray that you'll use your word, your holy engrafted word to strengthen and to build. Men and women of God, great men and women of God, great couples, great 
families build greatness right here by the power of the Spirit. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, but it may be that you're here and you don't know the Lord, but you'd like to get to know God. This is your day. You can know him for yourself. And if that's you and you want to get to know him, well, how, how does that happen? What do I need to do? Uh, who's going to help me? Uh, may the God of peace himself sanctify you. We said at the beginning of this message, there's something that God wants to do for you. But he won't do it without your permission. Without your permission. That's the reason why in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, you hear this powerful passage. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'm not going to force it open, opens the door, I will come in. So he's willing to come in right now if you'll let him. Father, draw as only you can do. In Jesus' name, let's all stand now. If you don't know the Lord, but you'd like to get to know him, I want to ask you to do something that only you can do. Only you can do. You know there are some religions in the world that have what's called forced conversion. You better join that religion. You better. I'll kill you if you don't. You know. I mean, literally. One of the three largest religions in the world has that mantra and forced conversion. But Jesus put it this way. Whosoever will, let him come. Let him come. If you want to know him, would you please step on out? Come right here to the front. Come on. Come now. Maybe in the balcony, that's all right. Step down the same steps you walked up. And come right here to the front. There's someone that's going to be standing here waiting for you. Pastors and counselors, would you come? Come now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Wherever you're seated, please come. With thanksgiving. Come on. I'll be a living sanctuary. Anyone else? Come on. Anyone else? Step on out and come. Lord, prepare me. Be a sanctuary. Anyone else? Tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living. I'll be a living sanctuary. Sanctuary. Just for you. Just for you. Anyone else? Anyone else who wants to come? There are people who, along with me, have been praying for you all week. You've been on their hearts. You've been on mine. Most importantly, you've been on the heart of God. And this is your moment. He knew you'd be here. He knew this would be your moment. You want to receive the Lord? You want him to come into your heart? Please, come on now. He won't do it without your permission. Come, come now. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Stretch your hand of faith out. We're going to pray for these who've come. But I want to tell you, it's not too late. Even while we're praying, you may come. Even while we're praying, you may come. Father, for these who stand before you, even as I'm praying, please come now. Bless with every spiritual blessing. Be glorified in their lives and witness. In the powerful name of Jesus, bless these that have come forward to join the church. And did I ask you that? You may be here and you want to join this church. You may already know the Lord. You may be in good standing with God. Come. And did I ask you if you've been backslidden, you want to get it right? You can come. Come. Come now. Come on. I bless, Father. Even while I'm praying, come. Bless these who come now. In the mighty name of Jesus. Take this same hand and put it on your own chest, would you please, and pray. Father, make me a witness. Use me to lead someone else to Christ. To bring someone to church. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. To my left is Elder Smith. I want to ask you to follow him out. Give the Lord a great big hand clap for these that have come.
Amen. Praise God. Amen. God is good. And all the time, God is good. Amen. Amen.